9 million criminals behind bars. Armed robbers, rapists and murderers. Most surrender to incarceration, but some fight back. Tonight, in Britain, a mass breakout by the IRA. So daring, he stopped a nation. The heart attack came out. The dead dude, they shot him in the head. In Australia, a love-struck girlfriend hijacks a helicopter to pull off the country's most audacious prison break. She pulled out a pistol and put it in the side of my head. I said, this is a hijack. In America, a desperate felon shoots his way out of a courtroom, leaving a trail of death. I looked first at the judge, and I knew instantly that he was already dead. This program contains recreations. The prison breaks are real. Belfast, Ireland, 1983. 38 IRA prisoners locked up during the violent conflict known as the Troubles are planning a desperate escape. The people that commit those sort of crimes um, have to a very large extent um, resigned from the human race. Um, I, I think one has to treat them uh, humanely, uh, but that means locking them up. To hold the increasing numbers of convicted IRA prisoners, the British government were forced to build a new maximum security facility. Her Majesty's prison, the maze. The prison was designed both in a secure and security manner, uh, as well as a political weapon to, to damage Republican struggle. The maze was a complex labyrinth of razor wire, high walls, and cell blocks designed to be escape-proof. For more than a quarter of a century, the maze held hundreds of the world's most dangerous men. I can remember one prisoner after a riot uh, in a now part of jail telling me that, remember, mister, you're not dealing with me and here you're dealing with an army. And that's what these men were. They were soldiers of an army, well-disciplined soldiers of an army. Life inside this prison was brutal, for inmates and guards alike. There were 30 prison officers shot dead during the Troubles. There were 50, even more, prison officers who committed suicide. The most dangerous prisoners were held in one of the eight maximum security blocks, known simply as age. At the flick of a switch in the central control room, each wing can be locked down. The linear layout is especially designed to allow a line of sight connection between all of the prison officers. Despite the high level of security, the IRA were plotting an audacious breakout. As members of the Irish Republican Army, they felt that it was their duty to escape. They believed themselves to be political prisoners and to be held by an enemy state, and therefore their incarceration, they felt, was illegal and they had a legal right and a duty to escape. And three senior members of the IRA were forming a plan in H Block 7. Jerry Kelly and Brendan McFarlane and Bobby Story had a leadership role within the prison population because of their um, experience. Brendan McFarlane, jailed for his part in the bombing of a Protestant pub in Belfast in 1975 sentenced to life imprisonment. Our experience of the Hitch Blacks was of a very, very brutal, harsh regime which was designed to depoliticize us and our struggle and to break the back of Republican struggle. Jerry Kelly, jailed for his part in the bombing of the Old Bailey in 1973, sentenced to life imprisonment. There was always two things in Republicans' minds. One was to educate and the other was to escape. And uh, depending, I suppose, on the length of sentence you were doing, <laughs> depended on what the priority was. But generally speaking, escape was the top priority. It certainly was with me. I was doing a, a life sentence. And Bobby's story. As a senior member of the IRA, he was convicted of possessing weapons. Sentenced to 18 years. There was a substantial political dedication to the success of the escape. 
They wanted to escape. They wanted to escape for two reasons. One, they didn't like being in prison. Most people don't. And the other was that um, they wanted to um, continue, if they could, uh, their terrorist campaigns. The maze was floodlit 24 hours a day, fully equipped with the latest security cameras, including motion sensors and listening devices. No one could have escaped out of the maze prison. There were far too many gates to go through. There was too many big high fences to get over. So it really was a very safe jail to be in as regards holding prisoners. But McFarlane, Kelly and Story were not planning to break out on their own. They were prepared to die for each other, and escape was, in the case of several of those prisoners, the number one priority. They were planning a mass breakout to liberate 38 Irish Republican Army prisoners, a plan requiring split-second timing to take down every guard in H Block 7, a plan so audacious it would shock Margaret Thatcher's government to its core. Fulton County Courthouse, 2005. Holding Atlanta's most dangerous remand prisoners, awaiting their day in court. This city center complex is rated maximum security. Considered escape proof by the armed deputies that guard it around the clock. In March 2005, Brian Nichols was on remand, awaiting a retrial. Charged with a false imprisonment and the brutal rape over a three-day period of his ex-girlfriend. By all accounts, the prosecutor was doing well, and it looked like Nichols was going to be convicted. He was a desperate man. A guilty verdict would see him locked up for the rest of his life. At 8.30 a.m. on March the 11th, a sheriff's deputy escorts Nichols to a holding cell deep inside the jail. How could a man shackled and surrounded by armed guards hope to escape through a labyrinth of locked doors? Nichols had a plan. He knew he'd be changing into civilian clothes to appear before Judge Roland Barnes. Deputy Cynthia Hall, a 51-year-old grandmother, removes Nichols' handcuffs, leaving him alone in his cell to change. Nichols was not only familiar with this routine. After many months on remand, he was now familiar with the building. As Deputy Hall returns to escort Nichols to the courtroom, he attacks her, beats her to the ground, and takes a gun. Deputy Hall suffered bruising to her brain and multiple facial fractures. Now armed and dangerous, Nichols runs from the cell and makes a split-second decision that will lead to a massacre. Silverwater Correctional Complex, 16 miles out of Sydney, 1999. New South Wales flagship maximum security mega prison home to 900 of its most dangerous criminals, guarded by 300 staff, utilizing state-of-the-art technology. Inside its walls, 57-year-old John Reginald Killick. His criminal career spans over 40 years. He's been convicted of nine armed robberies and served time in every state in Australia. Killick is now on remand awaiting trial for an armed robbery in which he walked into a bank, pointed his gun at the staff and walked away with $32,000. Any person does an armed robbery or a series of armed robberies uh, is going to be prima facie dangerous. Between stretches in jail, Killick had fallen in love with Lucy Dudko, a Russian librarian also known as Red Lucy. As Killick awaited sentencing in prison, love struck Lucy was missing him desperately. She was lost. She didn't know how to survive without John. One woman, alone with no resources, would she have any hope of penetrating one of Australia's toughest prisons? At 8.50 a.m. on the 25th of March, 
Lucy called John at Silverwater Prison. Prison records show that the call lasted just 26 seconds. The breakout is go. At 9 a.m., following his normal routine, Killick walks into the open space at the prison oval. At 9.05 a.m., Lucy arrives at the heliport. Turned up in a taxi, um, you know, paid for the flight, uh, you know, in cash, which is, is not uncommon, but not that common. She had very conspicuous looking, uh, you know, attire, let's say, and she was acting very agitated and time was absolutely to the, you know, uh, you know, critical. And, and there was, there's, I've never ever taken anyone on a harbour flight or that, that time is critical. The other critical factor for Lucy is concealing the machine gun and revolver in her shopping bags. Where she got these deadly weapons still remains a mystery. Her pilot, Tim Joyce, straps her in, takes off and banks the helicopter towards the Olympic Stadium. So I was pointing out the uh, Parramatta out to the left, the city out to the right and the Olympic Stadium in front. She said, oh, is that a prison up there? And I said, yeah, that's uh, Silverwater Jail. And uh, we continued on and she was looking very intently and said, oh, can we go any closer? And as I looked back, she suddenly opened up the bag and pulled out a pistol and put it in the side of my head and said, this is a hijack. The Maze Prison, Belfast, 1983. The entire population of Selbock H7 is planning an escape. No easy task from the most secure facility in Europe. The way the maze was planned was that there were prisons within prisons. So it was a very complex place to escape from. The inmates have realized that the food van that carries meals from the central prison kitchen to the cell blocks is the weak link they've been looking for. Three times a day, it passes back and forth through the chain mesh fencing surrounding cell block H7. The prison food lorry was identified as one of the key elements and a weak link in the system because this lorry traveled in and out of every block and also it was discovered that it traveled outside the camp. Their plan was simple. Seize control of the van, fill it with IRA prisoners and drive quietly through the front gate. But there was a complication. In a sense, if you were going to escape, you couldn't escape in small numbers. The entire block had to be taken. The control room had to be taken. That was the nerve center. If anything was going wrong, all of it would have come back to there. That was the heart of, the, if you like, the block. In preparation, the IRA prisoners had spent Thanks. months softening up their warders in cell block H7. We would identify the nature, the character, the hobbies of each of the warders. We would get people who had the similar legs, go up, have a cup of tea with them, have a, have a chat with them, spend an hour talking to them. They'd been pally with you, calling you by your first name. You'd been calling them by their first name, and you'd been the best of friends. You think you belong, Lost Brothers. The prisoners were strategically creating a situation where they could lull the authorities into a false sense of security. By Sunday 25th of September 1983, the prisoners have armed themselves with chisels, knives and hammers. Five of the senior IRA prisoners are armed with handguns. How these guns were smuggled into the prison has never been revealed. 2.30 p.m. Bobby Story is working H7 central area, known as the Circle. Unusually, he's cleaning the floors. He shouldn't have been doing that job. He was high up in the IRA. But I got a nod from the circle, let him through. So I just blew with the wind. My own conscience was saying, don't do it. But I wasn't going to rock the boat. Against prison procedures, co-conspirators Jerry Kelly and Brendan McFarlane have also been allowed into the circle. I was taken in. Oh, my God, I, I regret it to this bloody day. The signal was to be me calling for a cleaning machine. It's an electric polishing machine, uh, but it's called a bumper. Brendan McFarlane, 
gives a signal to attack. Have you got the bumper down there? And then turned around then. The gun was shoved into my stomach. I thought, oh, these boys mean business. Give me a key. Just handed the key. I thought, oh, I'm done for now. Within seconds, prison officers all over H Block 7 are overpowered and taken hostage. The actual operation of physically taking over, overpowering all the guards in H Block 7 didn't take any more than about 15 seconds. Their next hurdle is to overpower the officer in the central control room. And in that control room is alarms. If he had pulled that alarm, the escape would have stopped there and then. But, unwittingly, the door to the central control room has been left open. The warder who was on the floor in the control room jumped up and tried to close the door, a wooden door on Jerry Kelly. Prison officer Adams slams the door shut, but he can't lock it. Jerry Kelly, armed with a pistol, smashes his weight against the outside of the door. Desperate to hold the door shut, Officer Adams can't reach the alarm. Jerry Kelly is determined to get through the control room door. And he will stop at nothing to secure his freedom. Atlanta, Georgia, 2005. Brian Nichols, on remand for rape, has just escaped from his cell in Fulton County Courthouse. He could have escaped from the building by getting the lift straight to the street. But for reasons known only to him, he chooses to run across the sky bridge that leads directly to his courtroom, where Judge Roland Barnes is hearing the first case of the day. I heard a very loud sound. It was muffled, but it was a loud sound. And then a couple of seconds later, I heard an extremely loud sound. Nicholas walks up to Judge Barnes and shoots him in the head. I looked first at the judge, and I knew instantly that he was he had been shot and that he was already dead. Uh, I could see the bullet all, and he started slumping to the side. Nicholas turns and fires again, killing court reporter Julianne Brandau. My thoughts were, the judge is dead. I look straight ahead, and Mr. Nichols is standing in front of me, and he turns the gun and points it to me. Robbins dives out of the courtroom and runs for his life. A desperate felon, Nichols has shown he's prepared to kill. The question is, how many more will fall to his gun? Bravely, Deputy Hoyt Teasley chases Nichols through the building. But instead of running, Nichols turns on the deputy and without hesitation, fires point blank. As Deputy Teasley drops to the floor, fatally wounded, Nichols makes his escape. A ruthless killer is loose on the streets of Atlanta. We have a perpetrator at the Fulton County Courthouse, 136 Prior Street, who shot four individuals. The police are confused about how many people have been killed. And the deputies were just running around and saying, get out of the courthouse, get out of the courthouse. The guy who had the, the other deputy's gun just shot at him a couple of times. What law enforcement agencies fear most is that Nichols will kill again unless they can stop him. We are urging uh, any of you who are listening to this broadcast, if you've got any idea where this man is, uh, that you would please call the Atlanta Police Department and turn him in. The authorities need a miracle to stop this killer. Sydney, Australia, 1999. In the exercise yard of Silverwater Prison, convicted armed robber John Killick is scanning the skies. Just two miles away, his girlfriend, Lucy Dudko, has hijacked a helicopter at gunpoint and has forced the pilot, Tim Joyce, to change course towards the prison. 
In an attempt to raise the alarm, Joyce reaches forward to squawk the hijack code to air traffic control. But Red Lucy's father was a Soviet chopper pilot, and she knows exactly what Tim Joyce is doing. As I, I reached for the transponder to change it, she uh, quickly shouted out, no transponder. On the ground, John Killick knows that the most dangerous part of the escape will be taking off without being shot dead by the guards. Holding the gun to Joyce's head, Red Lucy forces him to begin his descent into the prison yard. Even before Joyce has touched down, Red Lucy's scanning the yard for her boyfriend. She says it's him, it's him, and he'd be easy to spot because of his shock of white hair. As Killick runs towards the helicopter, a prison guard runs after him. Another guard follows. The chopper blade's still whirling. John Killer came out of the, uh, the inner yard. Lucy gave him the machine gun, and he, he hopped in and pointed the machine gun at me. I, I know myself that you'd be, you'd be terrified. With Killick now in the helicopter, the prison guards open fire on the chopper. He took one bullet in the skid, one in the hydraulic servo at the rear of his, uh, uh, at the rear of the firewall upon which he seats, and uh, the third one I think went through the blade. If they make it over the wall alive, it's only the beginning of a life on the run. Downtown Atlanta is in a state of chaos. Brian Nichols has just escaped from Fulton County Jail. He broke out through the courtroom, shooting dead a judge, a court reporter, and a sheriff's deputy in the process. Armed and on the run in the middle of Atlanta, authorities know that Nichols presents a real threat. He is a dangerous individual. Uh, and uh, we ask that you take no risks, that you would call the police department as soon as possible. After first stealing a tow truck, Nichols realizes that he needs another, less conspicuous getaway vehicle. Almeta Kilgo is on her way to work. I was, you know, singing. I had my music on, you know, just trying to get to work on time uh, because I had a meeting and I was running a little bit late. What should have been a normal day is about to become the most frightening experience of her life. The tow truck came in behind me, uh, uh, and that was that was unusual because no tow truck would park in this particular garage. Get on the other side of the car. Get on the other side. Nichols opens the door of Elmetta's car. He said, "Move over." I'm telling you to move over. I'm not playing with you. Um, and he put the gun to my head. But instead of staying put, Almeta decides to make a run for it. After all the attention that Almeta had drawn, amazingly, Nichols lets her live and looks for a new escape vehicle. As Nichols steals a car and disappears into Atlanta traffic, a massive manhunt swings into operation. Now we apparently understand that Atlanta police have been joined by DeKalb County Police helicopters. So we now have multiple jurisdictions over the downtown area in the air trying to locate this individual that has been involved in this uh, multiple shooting and now multiple carjackings in an attempt to get away from the scene. As Nichols' crime spree spiraled out of control, it became apparent just how serious the situation had become. The Mays Prison, Belfast, September 1983. The biggest escape in British history is underway. IRA prisoners have overpowered almost every guard in the maximum security H block. In the control room, prison officer Adams is fighting to keep the unlocked door closed with his body weight. He's only meters from an alarm switch, but if he moves to trigger the alarm, he'll be shot. The door is forced open several inches. This is now be very clear about this. This is an IRA operation. Uh, if you do exactly what you're told, you'll be fine. If you do not, we will not jeopardize uh, this escape. Kelly squeezes his pistol through the gap in the door and fires two shots at Adams. The heart attack came out. 
a dead deer, the shot him in the head. One bullet enters Adam's eye socket, but amazingly, it doesn't kill him. The IRA prisoners are now in control of all internal security systems in cell block seven. The prison officers are moved into two rooms attached to the circle and forced to strip. As the food van arrives and parks in the usual place, its driver, prison officer David McLaughlin, is taken hostage. The driver had to be secured. He then had to be sort of briefed in what was expected from him because he is the only person that could have driven that van around the camp. We couldn't do it, not even dressed up in prison officer's uniform. Just after 3 p.m., 38 of the IRA's most dangerous prisoners climb into the back of the waiting food delivery van. Jerry Kelly takes his position on the floor of the cab. Jerry Kelly was lying down with a pistol in the groin of the driver. Uh, his foot was tied to the clutch of the uh, truck. He was told there was a grenade there and that if he moved at any time uh, or if he went the wrong direction, that I knew the way out, which I did, um, that I would pull the pin or else I would shoot him. There was no grenade, by the way. Kelly orders McLaughlin to drive to their final hurdle, the Tally Lodge gate, a one-mile journey. Standing between them and the gates are two internal checkpoints. The van approaches the first checkpoint. Because officers on the gates were familiar with that lorry passing through three, four and five times a day, with the same driver and the same orderly, checks weren't made properly. Passing undetected through gate after gate, the hijacked van reaches the final checkpoint. The Tally Lodge is the only way out of the maze. The Tally Lodge is just the place where the workforce clocks in the work and clocks out. Nine of the 38 men jump out of the back of the van carrying four handguns. Dressed in prison officers' uniforms, they take the guards on duty completely by surprise. After a brief struggle, the prison officers working on the gate are taken hostage. The gate is now under the IRA's control, but they have a problem. We arrived in the Tally Lodge area slightly later than what we, than what we intended to. The late arrival of the van coincides with the prison officers' change of shift. There was between 30 and 40 prison officers, and they all ended up lying basically on the floor. One of the prison officers who was coming off duty got away and ran off, and he raised the alarm. In the battle for the Tally Lodge gates, Officer James Ferris is fatally stabbed. Jimmy's dead. That's Jimmy Ferris. <sighs> Make it mine. With an officer down, the plan has spun out of control. Prison officers knew that we were in trouble, that we were that we were sort of facing difficulties, and, and they were shouting at us, give yourselves up, it's all over. With the British Army snipers in the watchtowers zeroing in on their position, the prisoners have to make a split-second decision. Surrender or run for their lives. In Sydney, Australia, John Killick's girlfriend, Lucy Dudko, a.k.a. Red Lucy, has hijacked a commercial helicopter. She forces the pilot, Tim Joyce, to fly at gunpoint to Silverwater Prison, aiming to snatch her lover, multiple armed robber, John Killick. She orders the chopper to land in the exercise yard, and as the armed prison guards open fire, John Killick climbs aboard. In a hail of bullets, they take off. Started and finished within 40 seconds, I reckon. Simple as that. Cruised in, done the job, picked him up like he was picking a parcel up, cruised out, no panic, and out of there. As they land in a nearby park, the relationship is already under strain. There was an argument between them. Um, Lucy wanted Tim Joyce to be taken as a hostage. John wanted to leave him there. They compromised and they tied him up. Certainly could have taken me hostage and uh, taken me in the boot of a car somewhere and they could have, could have shot me for, uh, for that matter. So um, I suppose to a certain extent I'm grateful for that. 
Armed and dangerous, this modern-day Bonnie and Clyde flee, hijacking a car, taking the driver hostage. At the window, he said, we've got some trouble, we want you to drive us somewhere. If you don't, I'll shoot you in the leg. Killick and Red Lucy forced the driver to take them into the city, where they abandon the car near Killick's apartment and then disappear. I mean, there were literally hundreds of, of bits and pieces of information, so-called information, coming in. This fellow uh, does not intend to surrender if he gets caught and my uh, will uh, uh, shoot it out uh, rather than give up. After 38 days on the run, Killick and Dudko were holed up 700 miles away in Melbourne, but by now, they were flat broke. Police allege John Killick and his girlfriend Lucy Dudko robbed this Footscray motel in Melbourne's western suburbs on Wednesday night. It's claimed they then abducted the motel's 42-year-old receptionist, forcing him to drive them to Sydney. I never thought that I'd survive. Never. Never. I was in more fear of her than him. But I believe the woman who cares so much to, to break somebody out of jail, to risk that, would do anything. Keeping one step ahead of police, career criminal Killick and his machine gun toting girlfriend are on a nationwide crime spree. How can they be stopped? In Atlanta, the courthouse massacre has spilled out onto the streets. Brian Nichols has shot and killed three people while escaping from custody. On the run, he's carjacked multiple vehicles at gunpoint and then disappeared without trace. His escape has now triggered the largest manhunt in the city's history. The buzz around the metro Atlanta area was, uh, it was palpable. I mean, people were in fear. They weren't going out at night like they normally would. Hours later, Nichols resurfaces in the Atlanta suburb of Buckhead where he shoots and kills immigration and customs enforcement agent, David Wilhelm. Taking the ICE agent's gun, his badge, and his pickup truck, Nichols is now looking for somewhere to hide. After he killed the ICE agent, uh, he drove uh, the ICE agent's truck to the Duluth area. Uh, at some point, he came across Ashley Smith. At 5 p.m., 27-year-old Ashley Smith widowed mother of one returns to her apartment. I put my key in the door and I unlocked it and I turned around and he was right there. And I started to scream and he put a gun to my side and he said, don't scream. If you don't scream, I won't hurt you. So I said, all right, okay, I won't scream. Um, we went in the house and he shut and locked the door. He said, you know, the Somebody could have heard your scream already, and if they did, the police are on the way, and I'm gonna have to hold you hostage, and I'm gonna have to kill you, and probably myself and lots of other people. And I don't want that. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll do what you say. He said he, wouldn't, he wanted to take a shower. So I said, okay, you can take a shower. Um, he said, well, I'm gonna put a towel over your head so you don't have to, uh, to watch me take a shower. Sensing that behind the gun, Nichols has a softer side she can reason with. Ashley Smith begins to tell him about her life. My husband died four years ago. And I told him that if he hurt me, my little girl wouldn't have a mommy or a daddy. And she was expecting to see me the next morning. And if he didn't let me go, she would be really upset. Every day I will bless thee, and I will praise the name forever and ever. Great is the Lord Ashley told great Nichols how God was changing her life. For seven hours, Ashley talks to him and even reads him excerpts from her Bible. He needed hope for his life. He told me that he was already dead. He said, look at me. Look at my eyes. I am already dead. And I said, you are not dead. You are standing right in front of me. This is the man that you should be looking for. He is armed and dangerous, but if you... Uh, we watched the news. He looked at the TV and he just said, I cannot believe that's me on there. 
The next morning, 24 hours after the killing spree began, Ashley Smith asks Nichols to allow her to visit her daughter. As soon as she is out of her apartment, Ashley calls 911. She had made it out, called 911. The page did not indicate that, that there was any hostage involved, only that there was a lone barricaded gunman armed with uh, multiple weapons. Taking no chances, Lieutenant Tom Doran and the Gwinnett County SWAT team move in on the apartment. Uh, I went over and spoke with Ashley and had her draw me a diagram uh, of the interior of the apartment. The SWAT team has been given clear orders to shoot Nichols if he refuses to give up without a fight. I then directed our entry team uh, using ballistic shields to move into a position where we could observe the door. The SWAT team are ordered to storm the apartment. If he came out with a weapon, he did not submit to arrest, he would be shot. Surrounded by armed police and heavily outnumbered, Nichols gave up without a shot being fired. One of the interesting things uh, that I observed when I went in the apartment was I, I, I looked over at the television that said Gwinnett SWAT surrounds Nichols' apartment. So he had been watching us uh, the entire time from video feed from one of the news organizations. Nichols was indicted on 54 counts. These included four murders, kidnapping, robbery, aggravated assault, battery theft, carjacking, and escape from authorities. Nichols is likely never to be released. Ironically, he's still waiting the retrial for the alleged rape of his ex-girlfriend. Australia, 1999. Six weeks after the country's first ever helicopter jailbreak. Armed robber John Killick and his lover Lucy Dudko are still on the run tonight after their daring hijacked helicopter breakout from Silverwater Jail. When they're tracked down, police fear a shootout with the desperate fugitives. On the 8th of May, after 40 days on the run, the armed and dangerous lovers go to ground and check into Sydney's Bass Hill Tourist Park. John and Lucy settle in for another night on the run, but the manager has recognised them and already called police. It was a, a, a fairly large uh, operation, bearing in mind that what we were concerned about was the danger to other people in the caravan park. As roadblocks are set up on the Hume Highway, the tourist park is surrounded by armed police. Two reconnaissance officers take up position in the next door caravan. Killick and Dudko are unaware as more armed police move in around the cabin. At 2.20 a.m., police make their move. John Killick would have felt a sinking in the stomach and the inevitable had arrived. After 15 minutes of tense negotiations, John Killick surrendered. Red Lucy came out soon after. I had big lights on him and the dogs down there and there was, as I say, the whole place was surrounded by SWAT team. Australia's most wanted couple, John Killick and Lucy Dudko, are in custody tonight. John Killick was sentenced to 28 years in prison. Lucy Dudko was sentenced to 10 years. Their request for a jail wedding was denied. And one day, John rang her and a prison guard came back to the phone and reported, she doesn't want to have anything to do with you. He was heartbroken, and that was the end of their relationship. Killick will not be eligible for parole until 2013. In Belfast, the main gate of the Mays prison is in total turmoil. The meticulously planned Mass IRA prison breakout has hit an unforeseen problem. Just as the prison van they had hijacked arrived at the last checkpoint, dozens of prison guards were turning up for work. A prison officer recognised McFarlane as he opened the final outer gate. He blew his whistle and raised the alarm. His whistles go on, they, they now knew it was an escape, but up to this stage they thought it was a small number of people. In fact, there are 38 IRA prisoners attempting to escape. 
I had them out the back and said, let's go, everybody go. So they jumped out of the back of the line and we all ran out the front gate across what was called the governor's car park and into the fields. There was three of us at that point um, were pistols who were trying to um, hold back the screws. The snipers in the watchtowers are reluctant to fire on anyone for fear of shooting a guard in the melee. We were fighting. I was in uniform and others of us were, were in prison staff, prison officers in uniform, and we were fighting with prison guards who were in uniform. So there was this big mixture of people fighting each other, hijacking cars, people then pouring across the road, fighting across the road, and jumping across this coils of, of barbed wire into an open field which sloped up. Amazingly, all 38 of the IRA prisoners make the break. While the rest of us poured over this fence into a field and made our way off up the field in different directions. When the prisoners got over the fence, they, they ran up the field, uh, broke off um, into different groups. Bobby Story and three others run and hide under the reeds in a nearby river. Every part of us was under the water except this this part. So we had, we had our heads right back into the water and we were holding on out of the side of the bank and there was, one of us was getting the shakes because of the coldness of the water and that's what was causing the ripples. As officers begin searching the river banks, one spots the ripples in the water. And they arrested us, stripped us of our clothes, uh, the handcuffed us at the side of the bank. Ahead of the search parties, McFarlane and seven others steal a Mercedes and drive to a farmhouse in Dromore. We drove in, secured the family in the house, and noticed that there was a doorway to the side of the house, which was almost like a drive-in workshop. And we were able to drive the car in and close the door down. So from the air, we had disappeared from view altogether. They run by night and hide by day for four nights until they'd reached the Republican-friendly area of Armagh. Jerry Kelly and his group carjack a series of vehicles, fleeing to Lurgan, where they squeeze under the floorboards of a Republican house. You couldn't set up. Um, when we first went in, there was a lot of rubble from when the house had been built. We pushed the rubble to the back. We got sleeping bags in. We got a bucket down, we got uh, coffee jars, uh, jam jars, stuff like that. They may be out of the maze, but the whole of England and Ireland are now on high alert. One of the biggest search operations ever mounted in the province is now underway. All available soldiers and police, including members of the Ulster Defence Regiment, have been called out on duty. Of the 38 men who escaped, 19 remained on the run for a significant amount of time. Three were never recaptured. For the Republican community itself, the breakout was an enormous boost to their confidence. Jerry Kelly and Brenda McFarlane were on the run for almost two and a half years before their arrest in Amsterdam in 1986. After his release in 1989, Jerry Kelly played a major role in negotiating the Good Friday Peace Agreement that finally ended the Troubles on 10th of April, 1998. Over the following months, 428 paramilitary prisoners were released. And with only four remaining inmates, the Mays prison was finally closed on September the 29th, 2000.